Hi. Continuing on with our discussion of uh, ceramics in Chapter 12, I'd like to talk about some of the more important ceramics um, that are out there. So the one of the most important is the silicate ceramics. And the reason for that is, of course, that the most common elements on planet Earth are silicon and oxygen. And so we have a lot of silicates out there. Basically, what you've got for silicate ceramics is um, silicon in its center of a little tetrahedon right here. Okay, so here's your silicon in blue and your oxygen anions surrounding it. Um, and that's how it likes to stack. The SiO4 is the basic unit. Um, some really common forms of uh, silica are the polymorphic forms quartz, cristobalite, and tritomite. And you can see cristobalite right here. It's got kind of a complicated looking structure, um, maybe best viewed in a three-dimensional rotational site like on our uh, course website. And those strong silicon oxygen bonds, those strong covalent bonds, lead to high melting temperatures um, for this material, about 1700 degrees Celsius, so that's really, really quite hot. Um, but they also have relatively low densities, also because of that covalent character of the bonds. Okay, so like I said, the basic unit is this SiO4 tetrahedron, and it likes to structure itself and stack itself so that it maintains that tetrahedron. The most common form of uh, probably the silicates is quartz. Uh, it's found naturally in a lot of minerals. That's a three-dimensional network when the adjacent silicon atoms share two of the oxygens with, so that the ratio is one to two, um, and uh, it has a really high melting point, really low density. Silicon doesn't have to form uh, a crystalline structure. It can be non-crystalline or amorphous. In fact, glass um, is a non-crystalline or amorphous form of silicon. And so what you do there is you have the fused silica to which no impurities have been added, but you can also dope it with common impurity items like sodium, calcium, aluminum, and boron. Um, for example, sodium, silicon, oxygen, that's soda glass, which is a really common form of glass. Okay, here's your silicates, and it shows how they form these bonds. Um, basically, what happens is the bonding of those adjacent tetrahedral structures is accomplished by sharing the common corners, edges, or faces, and you can see some of the structures right here. If you have some cations in there, um, such as calcium, magnesium, and aluminum, then it can help to maintain charge neutrality and also to ionically bond the silicates to one another. Um, so you get a lot of structures that have those particular cations mixed in with your silicates forming different minerals and such. You've also got a lot of layered silicates out there. You're probably familiar with mica or some of the clays or talc. Um, and in those, you have your tetrahedra connected together to form a two-dimensional plane. And then each negative charge is associated with the SI205 units. But then um, you have those negative charges sort of sticking up out of the plane. And then the negative charge is balanced by the adjacent plane, which is rich in the positively charged cations. Now, the bonding in between between the planes is much weaker than the bonding within the plane, and so these materials have a tendency to peel right off like mica um, or those clays. So they're bonded weakly in between planes and very strongly within the plane. Um, here's an example of uh, a layered silicate. It's a kaolinite clay, um, which is a layer with another layer containing a lot of aluminum. Okay, so you can see that. And adjacent sheets are loosely bound to one another by those uh, van der Waals forces. Now these layered or pillar clays have a lot of applications. Um, so these pillar clays are examples of the interlayer materials. They're thermally stable. They, they're very porous, um, which makes them attractive for a lot of reasons. Um, they have uh, good properties as catalysts because they are porous and they have a large surface area to volume ratio. Um, and uh, they're also, they have a high solid acidity. Okay, so this is an example of Montmorillonite, which is an example of a pillared clay. Um, here's the structure of Montmorillonite in particular. It's a 2-1 clay, so it has two tetrahedral sheets sandwiching an octahedral sheet, and the particles um, that come out are these plate-shaped um, that have diameters of about one micrometer. 
Now these things are really super useful because they can act as ion exchangers like zeolites and other things, they act as ion exchangers. So the ion exchange in the minerals is a reversible chemical reaction and it takes place between ions held near a mineral surface by unbalanced electrical charges within the framework and the ions in the solution contact. So the excess charge on the mineral is negative, it attracts the cations from the solution and neutralizes the charge. So since it acts as an ion exchanger, it has a lot of really interesting applications and properties. For example, medical uses. Clay, some of these clays are used in chelation therapy. So chelation therapy is if you get poisoning from say a heavy metal poisoning, then what happens is they pull your blood out and they pass it through and the montmorillonite actually renders the harmful components inert and then allows them to pass out naturally. So it filters out those really nasty heavy metals that are present in your blood when you've been poisoned. So that's one application of it. Another fun application of this ion exchanger stuff is that these clays can act as a natural antibacterial agent. There have been some clinical studies, many clinical studies, that repeatedly show that it can be an effective treatment for a lot of different medical issues. It's been used for a long time in mud masks for face and as treatment on open wounds, and it's a topical treatment for skin problems too. And these studies, these recent clinical studies, have shown that E. coli and other bacteria actually die in the presence of these medicinal clays. And Montmorillonite appears to significantly reduce the rate, uh, growth rate of MRSA as well. And MRSA is known to be really, really difficult to kill with antibiotics. So this is um, an exciting result. More interesting properties of these clays is that the water con the content of the Montmorillonite is variable, so it can uh, take on and, re and get rid of water very easily. Um, and so they expand a lot in the presence of water, um, and the amount of expansion is usually due to the type of cation that's in the sample. So you can take these natural clays, engineer them a little bit, substitute in different cations because it's a great ion exchanger, and then um, you can uh, make your material a lot better of, a, uh, of uh, an absorbent of water. And of course, some of the uses for that are desiccants, right? It's also used in the oil drilling industry as a component of drilling mud because it holds the water well, and so it makes this nice slurry which keeps the drill cool and helps remove the solids. Um, it can also use to hold soil in the water. So if you have a, uh, an area that's really prone to drought and you mix some of these clays in and you get them really wet, then it'll hold that water in rather than letting it evaporate off. It's used in dams and levees to prevent flu fluid liquid, uh, leakage and it also is a desiccant. It removes moisture and air. Um, the swelling properties of the clays are great for plugs for landfills. It's shown here. This guy, this landfill, um, used polyethylene sheets in combination with a geocomposite clay, a montmorillonite type clay, to prevent water from leaking out of the landfill. Of course, the water there would be contaminated and disgusting, and you wouldn't want to get it in your water supply. So that's some of the cool stuff about silicon clays and um, ceramics and composites. So, or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, ceramics. So moving on, let's talk about carbon, which is another important um, material. Carbon materials aren't, you know, t uh, technically ceramics, but it's really hard to figure out where to put them in a material science course, and they belong here as well as they belong in any, in any other section. So let's talk about them here. So carbon um, forms interesting um, crystalline structures. Depending upon how it was processed or formed, it can form uh, in diamond and graphite, in buckyballs and bucky tubes, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different forms of carbon. The first one that we could talk about is diamond. It's the tetrahedral bonding of carbon. Um, it's the hardest material known, and it has a very high thermal conductivity. It's used in gemstones because it is so hard. It's also used uses an abrasive and thin films to make things tougher and more resistant to wear. So here's what the diamond crystalline structure looks like. Now it's kind of interesting to contrast the diamond form of carbon with graphite, right? If these two materials couldn't seem to be on their face to be any more different. Diamond is the hardest material. Graphite is used as a lubricant and it's really soft. It's the, if you've ever had a solid lock, lock lubricant that puffs out this little black powder, that's most likely graphite. It could also be molydisulfide, but it might be graphite lock lubricant. 
what happens with that is that the crystalline structure is just totally different. It's a different form of carbon. So in graphite, you have this hexagonal structure within the sheet that the carbon likes to form in. And then it, it's very strongly bound within the sheet, but between neighboring sheets, the bonding is very weak. And so these planes like to slide across one another, which is why it makes a really good lubricant. Um, the van der Waals forces between the layers are just not very strong. However, if you take just a single sheet of carbon, then you have, uh, I'm sorry, of graphite, then you have what's called graphene. The term graphene first appeared in 1987 to describe these single sheets of graphite. And it's basically a two-dimensional material because it's only one atom thick. And it was uh, first reliably produced in 2004 by these two people right here um, at the University of Manchester. And what they did, it's, it's really fun. Um, I wish I had thought of it. I could have had a Nobel Prize myself. But basically, they just took graphite, they stuck tape on top, uh, double-sided sticky tape, and they peeled it off in single layers, and there's their graphene, huh? Right? There's your Nobel Prize right there. Great. I mean, just really, really good. Anyway, they won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in 2010 for their work that they did on these sheets that they produced, revealing some of the, the fascinating properties of this two-dimensional material. And what are those fascinating properties? Well, if you think about it, graphite, it's naturally very brittle. It can't be used as a structural material because of the weakness of the shear planes, although you can mix it in uh, to steels if you want to. But graphene? Um, it is the strongest material ever recorded. It's more than 300 times stronger than A36 structural steel at 136 gigapascals, and it's more than 40 times stronger than diamond, but it's so thin, it's transparent. Fascinating stuff. So this is a Marvel comic, right? Uh, Marvel's really uh, quick to jump on some of the great technological advances. In this one, uh, this guy, this villain shoots um, Iron Man in the face, but Iron Man's face is protected by a thin sheet of graphene, right? It's called graphene, stronger than most steels and transparent, okay? Anyway, so not only is it extraordinarily strong, it's also super light. It's 0.77 milligrams per square meter to compare one square meter of paper is about a thousand times heavier. It's often said that a single sheet of graphene that's one atom thick, sufficient in size to cover a whole football field, would weigh under a gram. Now, it's super strong, it's super lightweight, it's super thin. If you're not thinking body armor, I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? So these guys, I cite um, their work here. Uh, what happened is they had these little glass bullets that they shot at the graphene sheets, and they measured the speeds of the little bullets before and after they came out of the graphene. The micro bullets penetrated the sheets, um, and then from the measurements of the exit velocity, they figured out how much energy was required to punch through the graphene. And in their study, they found that the energy required to puncture layers of graphene was 8 to 12 times greater than the energy required for a comparable mass of steel. And the only material that's better at being bulletproof would be maybe Kevlar, okay? And that would come close, but maybe not beat it. So there you go, Iron Man. You're, you're safe, right? <laughs> Another really cool and fun allotrope of carbon are fullerenes. So fullerenes are molecules of carbon that are formed in the shapes of spheres, ellipsoids, tubes, and others. So the spherical fullerenes are often called buckyballs because they resemble um, the balls that are used in football and soccer, and they're named after Bunkminster Fuller, who came up with the structure of the geodesic dome. And the cylindrical ones are called carbon nanotubes or bucky tubes. Um, fullerenes um, are similar in structure to graphite, which is, of course, that hexagonal ring structure in the plane, except that plane has been rolled up either into a tube or into a ball. These guys um, got the Nobel Prize in 1996, Curl, Croto, and Smalley, um, for their uh, uh, discovery of fullerenes. What they were doing is they were actually studying... Um, uh, soot. They were making soot in a laboratory environment for some studies for astrophysics, um, and so it was kind of a happy accident. Now, um, 
Carbon nanotubes, the oft sometimes abbreviated CNTs, because material scientists just can't resist making an acronym. But anyway, they're allotropes of carbon with a cylindrical nanostructure. Nanotubes are really fascinating because their uh, ratio of their length to diameter can be 132 million to one. And that's significantly larger than for any other material. So they make great nanowires um, if you're thinking in that way. Even regular nanotubes only have diameters of about 2 nanometers and they can have lengths up to 100 micrometers depending upon how you fabricate them. So basically you've made yourself a nanowire. Now the fun, another fun fact about nanotubes is that um, you can roll the sheet up, that graphite, graphene sheet up into different ways. So you could roll it this way, you could turn it, you could turn it different ways and depending upon what's called the chirality of the nanotube, that means how you roll it up, then it can be um, either insulating or a semiconductor or an excellent conductor of electricity. Okay, so that's kind of fun. Um, the different structures, uh, either armchair or zigzag or chiral, that changes the electrical properties of the nanotubes. Um, the small circumference of the tubes means that current can't be conducted in the sort of lateral directions. It can only be conducted along the wire. So basically, you've got yourself a one-dimensional nanowire. And being able to make a wire that small is really fascinating and exceptional. And there's all kinds of applications for these things. They're being used for um, uh, field effect transistors on the nanoscale and a lot of other really cool stuff. So this is an STM image I showed here at right of a carbon nanotube draped across some platinum electrodes actually being able to conduct electricity between those electrodes. Really fascinating stuff. Now, because they make, um, they're so lightweight and they are such good conductors, then they make really nice lightweight cables. Okay, and the high electrical conductivity com uh, combined with that light weight makes them excellent shielding for electromagnetic radiation. So they might be good protection from an electromagnetic pulse weapon, of course, because then they could carry away that pulse current um, and act as sort of like a, inside a Gaussian surface, protecting you and shielding you inside um, from the from the field. And uh, they would reduce the weight of electrical cables um, that uh, have these shields. And so they've already been used for this purpose. Of course, one area where you really, really, really might want to worry about what the weight of your electrical cables are is for space. Um, and of course, you need a lot of shielding, electric um, shielding in space. And so Lockheed Martin, um, their subsidiary Applied Nanostructured Solutions, they produced the carbon nanostructure infused fiber that was used to make the contour supports um, that prevent thermal blanketing from interfering with uh, the Juno solar array. And this was launched um, in August 5th of 2011. And it has a carbon nanostructure infused composite material that supports and reduces Juno's weight because of the lightweight of the carbon. And um, it also provides an electrostatic discharge path shielding and grounding for the electronics um, with a very low payload, which is really important to NASA. So silicates, carbon materials, two really important um, materials for us in terms of the engineering, also really, really common here on planet Earth um, and used for a lot of great applications. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, I'll see you in class.